Your dear forehead is like a broad open field. Your eyes like two glowing jewels. Your mane like rich brocade. Your ears are like twin brothers. Your back brings a man to his heart's desire. I shall not call you horse, but brother. Better than any brother. From the heroic tales of the Oghuz Turks. In this series, we will look at the Ottoman Empire, one of the most powerful empires to have existed in the last 1,000 years. Each episode will cover one or more of the rulers that helped shape the empire for better or worse. We start the series with the conditions that gave rise to Ottoman founder Osman I, a man whose life was never documented to the level of detail of that of his descendants, a man whose life is shrouded in few facts and many myths, myths that have given rise to legend. But one fact is crystal clear. He laid the foundation for his son and others to build an empire that would instill a combination of fear, awe, and wonder into Christian Europe. We will cover the empire's military expansion, their victories, their losses, which were not just troop losses or territorial, but also included one of their sultans, and his son. We will also examine the diversity of the imperial court as the concept and reality of bloodlines and of what being Turkish meant are not as clearly defined as one might think. For example, the Ottomans themselves had no concept of the term Turkish. That would be a later creation. Lastly, we will examine the accomplishments of the Ottomans in terms of technological innovations, architecture, and art. Their experiment in empire would last 623 years, ending only formally in the previous 20th century, but the seeds of that decline started much earlier. As a result, they would outlast even if barely some rivals of theirs like the Habsburgs, Safavids, and Imperial Russia. What were the events and conditions that gave rise to this empire? Much of their founding is shrouded in the unknown and lost to the shifting sands of time. Attempts to provide historical context only being first applied a century after its founder's death, not during his lifetime. Contemporary accounts, therefore, of the man are scarce. To understand the rise, we need to go back to the 9th century and the Seljuk dynasties. They were a dynasty of nomadic Oghuz Turks hailing from the steppes of Central Asia and Outer Mongolia. In the late 9th century, Turkic mercenaries encountered the Western Muslim dynasties, causing many of their numbers to convert to the Islamic faith. By the 11th century, conditions had changed and the Oghuz horsemen would descend upon the eastern reaches of Anatolia in a bid to claim land of their own. They would loot and plunder their way to the borders of what was left of the once mighty Roman Empire that we now refer to academically as Byzantium. They would sweep into the lands of Persia and help form the Seljuk Empire that would control land from the shores east of the Bosporus to what is now Pakistan and up to the lands that their forefathers had first crossed over there would be an exchange of culture between the Turkic invaders and Persians that would flow both ways and shape the face of many of the countries now in the region today. Events between the Byzantine Empire and Seljuks would culminate at the Battle of Manzikert, where the Sultan Alp Arslan of the Seljuk Empire would face the Roman Emperor Romanos IV. He would not only win the battle, but capture the Emperor. This would be the spark from which these lands would be forever transformed. The Turks would, as a result of Byzantines fleeing their lands, move in and occupy them. Their base at Nicaea would soon be joined in 1096 by Jerusalem, which would find itself as part of the Seljuk domains. They would also help usher in the Crusades, as Pope Urban II, shocked at these events, would call for a crusade to attempt to liberate the Holy Lands. And in a twist of future irony, the Crusades would further weaken the Byzantines and set them up for a series of future encounters with the Turks. The Seljuks 
would be repelled from Nicaea and returned to Anatolia, where they would annex much of the Anatolian Turkic lands and eventually break away from their Iranian counterparts, becoming instead the Seljuks of Rum. The Byzantines would attempt again in 1176 to lay claim to what they felt were their lands. However, the Sultan Kiliz Arslan II would defeat his counterpart, the Emperor Emmanuel's armies in the southwest of Anatolia. This would give the Turks an open pathway to the Anatolian coast, which would in turn increase their fortunes by providing additional trade routes. In the 1200s, they would establish a peace with what was an even smaller footprint of Byzantine holdings, but it would be but a temporary measure, as a storm was brewing in the east. The empire they had split from a region now referred to as Khwarazmia was swept over by the Mongol hordes of Chinggis Khan, Everything in their path, people, buildings alike, raised to the ground in a fury the likes of which the region had not ever experienced. The Seljuks would attempt to, at first, ignore the threat of the Mongols and continued the building of infrastructure. But by 1243, the pressures would be too much and they would suffer a loss to the Mongols that would result in them becoming a vassal state of the Great Khanate. A decade later, the Mongol Empire itself would begin to fragment, and infighting among Seljuks and Mongols would leave behind a series of Turkic Beyliks, who were free to determine their own fate. From this chaos, one tribe in the northwest region, led by its warrior chief, would emerge to create a new order in the region. His name was Osman, and as mentioned earlier, his life shrouded by myths created where few facts and fiction collide. There is no argument, however, that he was the leader that would initiate the founding of an empire by his same name. He was said to have killed his own uncle after his father's death. His followers were not strictly speaking just free Turkic warriors. They also consisted of nomads, slaves, monks, and other displaced peoples. To this ragtag grouping of people, he promised land and plunder. However, he was quick to ensure his authority and rule would form the foundation of all future actions, including dissent, which he dealt with quickly and ruthlessly. Osman would conquer many of the neighboring tribes and grow his territory, but it is said he turned his gaze towards Constantinople and the south eastern European lands that lay beyond, feeling they were ripe for the taking, given how fragmented and weak he felt they had become. There's also a fictional story that appears in the late 15th century work of Asiki that says, Osman had a dream while sleeping in the house of a holy sheikh by the name of Edebali. It was said in the dream Osman envisioned a bright crescent moon rising from Edebali's breast and sinking into his own before a tree sprouted from his navel to cover all the world. Upon awakening, he relayed the dream to Edebali who told him that God had given him the imperial station for he and his descendants. Assisting the Ottomans was the Byzantine emperor Mikhail Palelogos. Before his recapture of Constantinople, a group of Byzantine soldiers called the Akriti protected the eastern lands almost as mercenaries, as they did so in exchange for tax exemptions and the ability to raid neighboring tribes outside of what was left of the empire's holdings. However, upon recapturing Constantinople, the emperor would disband the Akriti, pulling them instead into the main army's body, and so the damage would be done. The last protection that the empire experienced outside the city's walls were effectively removed and the Turks wasted no time in moving in. Many of the former Akriti, bitter over the disbanding, joined the Ottomans' banner. Osman would next make his way north, taking the last few eastern Byzantine vassal lands. His forces were mainly light-armored but extremely mobile mounted archers who used various tactics to encircle and demoralize their enemies. The Seljuk Turks faced their own political rivalry with the Fatimids in Egypt. Osman thus felt he was ready to remove the influence of the Seljuk Turks, who his father had been all but too happy to serve. And in its place, he hoped to build a new and independent Turkish kingdom. 
Information on his immediate family is almost non-existent. We know with certainty that he had at least one son, and we know he likely had two marriages. It's also fairly certain that his son who would succeed him, Orhan, was from his first marriage. Next, Osman would enter the city of Eskishare and seize a castle by the name of Karakahisar Castle. Sources say that he granted homes to settlers from various provinces. He next took the town of Yenisir, the so-called New City, where he built more homes for his men and made it his capital. Osman and his nomadic people would put down roots that would over time form the solid foundation from which his descendants would go on to conquer the region. Domestication, however, would not completely change their nomadic ways, at least not initially, and certainly not with regards to combat. As mentioned earlier, they still battled as people of the steppes. Nowhere was this more evident than the upcoming battle against the Byzantines. Osman had failed to take Nicaea, but this would set him up for a direct battle against the Byzantines called the Battle of Baphius. Near the shore of the Sea of Marmara, he would study the lay of the land and deploy his mounted archers to devastating effect. He had with him the same ragtag army. While the exact place of the battle is unknown, it would have likely been within sight of the city of Nicomedia. On the 27th of July in 1302, Osman's 5,000 light cavalry met the 2,000 Byzantines in battle. Osman's troops would have been a combination of his own and allies from the Turkish tribes of the region, such as the Pelagonia and those that inhabited the Meanda River. The Byzantine army represented their reduced prominence. They could barely muster 2,000 men, and half of those were mercenaries, Allen mercenaries, who for uncertain reasons did not even directly participate in the battle. The battle initiated with a charge by Osman's Turkish cavalry directly towards the smaller Byzantine army. They collided. And after but a brief clash, the Turks broke the Byzantine forward line, penetrating deep and forcing Musulan to withdraw to the nearby city under the cover of the Allen force. The result of Osman's victory is that his prestige in the eyes of many contemporary leaders would be raised. They would take notice. In addition, many other Turks and even Christian sympathizers would flock to his banner. He would next advance yet even closer to the coast, Along the way, he seized town after Byzantine town, in addition to forts and villages, effectively severing communication between Nicaea and Nicomedia. With his now larger army, he was able to conquer all of Bithynia's countryside, leaving only their major cities. The impact of this was to choke the Byzantine economy, particularly overland trade, almost into submission. The Byzantine response was not to pick up sword and shield against Osman. Instead, the emperor Andronicus II shocked many by offering a royal princess to Osman's in theory overlords, the Ilkhanid Khan based in Iran. The Mongols, however, would offer him no support, nor would the Spanish mercenary band the Catalan Grand Company, who instead invited the Turks to assist them in raiding the Balkans. The emperor finally turned to the Kingdom of Serbia, who accepted an alliance, but by then even most of the local peasants had been swayed over to Osman's banner. Osman continued his military push west of the Sakarya River until he reached the port of Mudanya. This had the effect of again cutting off an overland trade and lifeline route for the Byzantines to their city of Bursa. In his lifetime, Osman was unable to take the city of Bursa, despite having it be a priority for him in his final years. Nor was he able to take the city of Nicaea, but the towns and villages of the surrounding territory did fall to him and would provide him with much-needed agricultural benefits in addition to more coinage. He desired to again attempt to capture Bursa, but it would elude him. For his son, though, it would not, for his son would fulfill his vision. In the year 1323, Osman would die, but he succeeded in not only expanding his tribe's lands and possessions, but he left his son with a formidable fighting force and territory to rule over and to expand from, which we will cover in the next episode. 
of the rise and fall of the Ottoman Empire. I want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit that like button. And if uh, you enjoy the content and haven't yet, please consider subscribing. Love to have you on board. Till the next video, cheers.